Let's start. Welcome everyone, just for the recording. Welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on to tonight's event, the latest installment of our poetry series. My name is Matt Schumann. I am a programming librarian here at Cary. Uh, before we begin, please let me know in the chat if there's any technical issues that you're encountering and I can try to help. Um, if you have any questions at the end, please uh, you can do the raise hand thing and I'll unmute you or you can type them in the Q&A. Uh, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation and is organized and hosted by Cami Thomas, who will now say a few words before we begin. Thank you so much, Matt. It's always a pleasure to work with you. And uh, thanks to Cary Memorial Library in Lexington, Massachusetts for hosting us this evening. They are very wonderful and receptive to poetry, and I'm so appreciative. Um, You'll hear three strong poets tonight reading from new books, though one drawback to a Zoom reading is, of course, not being in a room together. Um, one result of that, among many results, is not being a, is not sitting next to a big pile of these shiny new books. So if you like what you hear tonight, please do go to these authors' websites and buy their books. It really matters. Um, the websites will appear in the chat or conveniently, I think you can just Google them and their websites will pop up because they are their names. Um, I want to say that I am personally particularly thrilled that two of tonight's poets, Chessie Normile and Soren Stockman, were once my excellent students at Concord Academy. Yes, I knew them in high school. And I've got stories. I'm incredibly pleased and not entirely surprised that they are now poets in their own right. And if you ask Chessie nicely, maybe she will be able to recite all 140 lines of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which she once did to the amazement of everyone in poetry class. Matt will now introduce our first reader Sarah Mathis. Matt. Thank you, Cami. Okay. So Sarah Mathis is a poet from central New Jersey. Her debut collection of poetry, Town Crier, won the Lexi Rednitsky First Book Prize and was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. She has received support from her work from the Yiddish Book Center and the Civit Civitella Renieri Foundation and is the recipient of the 2019 Tor House Prize from the Robinson Jeffers Foundation. A graduate of the Missioner Center for the Writers, she still lives in Austin, Texas, where she serves as a managing editor of Bat City Review, teaching poetry and also works at a bookstore. So now please welcome Sarah. Hi everyone. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to Matt for introducing me and Cami for organizing this. Um, and inviting me and to Chessie and Soren for reading with me. Um, Chessie and Soren went to high school together. Chessie and I uh, went to graduate school together. And so we all love school. Uh, and um, I'm really thrilled to be sharing work. I will be reading um, a couple poems from Town Crier, my book, um, but I'm gonna be honest with you guys, it came out in 2021. And I just, you know, I've had it up to here with this thing and um, I wanna share with you, but also I have been so lucky to feel like I've been back in the practice of writing again and writing in a way that um, is really uh, exciting for me where I'm kind of like trying to like have a nice time while writing poetry, which is, not always been the case for me. So I want to share some of those poems with you, if that's cool. Um, I'll start with one from the book, and then I'm going to read some new work. Um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll start with one as a kind of introductory way. It's called Sarah? Question mark, um, Which feels like a nice way for us to meet. Um, so yeah, Sarah? It wasn't my name that was said. It was just the word sincerity. But I inserted myself into the conversation anyway, and I had a lot to say. Walking home, I remember my favorite ever explanation of magic. It's about learning the true name of the sea, and then you have it. I designed a line of hats, dark and ballooning. My investors shook their heads. Who is your girl, they asked. Do you really think she would wear all of these sorrows? 
An important part of me is the smell of birds, each wing perfumed by the safety of trees, each perfume swung by seraphim, the wrong godly bringer of the bad bird. One day you said, serenade me, sure. That's when I take your hand around my wrist and you feel the wild moths. Just a quick memory here, making jello when mom and dad were out, spilling the unset mess all over our feet because we had forgotten the saran wrap, washing each other's feet. Can I borrow your hands? I need to quickly mummify this thing right here between us. Bring me a triceratops. I will die in a glow. Samsara, samsara, I will never die. Okay, that's from the book and town crier. And now I'm gonna read from this. And I'll start with um, this one. It's called Idea of Refrain. It is very easy for me to set an intention these days. When I said I was full of potential, that was a long time ago. My potential has soured into potential wine. I'm you, drunk, two years from now. I feel spicy and aphoristic. One of those two isn't true, but it's scary to claim one thing. If I go around planting flag after flag, maybe you'll know to keep off my grass. Jesse has a green laser pointer that can touch the sky. He circles the winter hexagon, hexagonates my eye. Orion, Orion sword and penis dangle, they are one. The middle brightness is a whole galaxy. How do I go home? I think I'll sing it again, is how the line goes in Cisco's thong song. You get to watch the idea of refrain occur to him. This is the delight and inauthenticity with which I start my day. Am I passionate? Am I desperate? I have let a sound govern one moment of your time. I have thought of a name I know that can be spoken by one long wave of the tongue in a still jaw. I want to press that name back into her. My hand is to my mouth. My eyes are up. They need her. Is shame passion? Passion shame? The grammar of the cross. If there is one untrue thing here, what would you guess it is? No, it's not the spice, it's the word one. Look at you pouring over my pinned insects. Of course, I'm not happy with how this is turning out. That was last year's burden. I am full of potential. I am full of potential. I think I'll sing it again. I think I'll sing it again. Okay, that's that one. <laughs> okay, let's try this new one. Um, oh, also these are PG-13, so. Should have said that earlier. <clears throat> Mom, if you're listening. <laughs> this one's called, my Reiki session was canceled. I am owed hands in my general vicinity. How am I to feel ease without instruction? Such masturbatory healing. Makes you wonder if J.G. Ballard was just making one novel length pun about autoeroticism. I too have thought to write books around phrases I like maroon marooning and one size fits all shrimp, God's banana and the devil's ice, which is all ice made by the hands of man. God's banana on the other hand, no longer exists because it sucked to eat, though it was beautiful. A steeply curved smile full of black seeds like beady teeth. It's saplings called suckers. It's trunk described as apparent, which I hear as alleged. Everyone's got a little banana fact in their fanny pack. Everyone knows about French bulldog pups, how they're cut from their unconscious mother, lest their large fleshy heads get lodged in her birth canal. We bred them and bred them, crossing science's submissive wires till they could not live without us and more and more and more still till they could not be born without us. I was bred for breeding for weeping in the corner, pissing my pantaloons and picking good bananas. Once we ate their tuber roots, we used their skins for silks. Once I would have died from exposure instead of being paid in it. 
I think the most successful French bulldog is the one that doesn't exist. I think the most successful banana is the one that doesn't exist anymore. I think the most successful me is the one that doesn't exist any more than is necessary. No worries. Let's reschedule for the next life. That was that one. <laughs> you gotta know how how bananas reference to the poem it is to read to such silence. <laughs> it's like it makes you feel. I mean, it's it's cool. It just makes you feel so insane. <laughs> But it's fun. I like it. Um, it makes me feel brave also in a way. Um, I feel like I'm expressing more than I normally would <laughs> to like make up for it. I got to fill the room with my own, you know. Um, okay, I'm gonna read this one now. Uh, this is really new. And again, I'm just like, I'm really trying to have a nice time. Um, so this one is called Alone at the Counter at Counter Cafe, which is um, a cafe next to the bookstore that I work to that I go and eat lunch at sometimes or breakfast at before my shifts. Um, and it's a really nice routine. So here I am once again, I'm torn into pieces before this Tupperware of croutons. Everything arrives at once. My single breakfast taco, my polyamorous grits. A retaining wall protects the potato frying oil. It roils, boils, toils. I too tend to identify too strongly with my rage. When I say cast me into the fire, I mean like meaningful dice. I mean deconstitute me completely in the pupa of your warm raised fist before my final union with the flame. Monogamy, from the Latin mono meaning one and gammy meaning grandma. Have you ever watched spinach be cooked so quick and careful? It arrives on the plate simultaneous with the slices of rye, met only moments later by the two eggs over easy, yellow eyes swirling in dreams behind albumin lids. I ask for yellow bird. She brings red. I ask for green. It explodes. I am without reason or napkin. Yet how full of reason is the day? Everyone's got one for something or other. Everything touchable can be made wipeable. Smear me across the napkin of your road. Clean me with the hanky of your panky. <laughs> and that's that one. <laughs> and okay, great, we're doing great. We're moving right along. Um, this next one is, uh, I wrote, actually I'm in, in a twist, I'm in Massachusetts right now. I live in Austin, Texas, but my family, uh, moved to Massachusetts. Um, I'm from New Jersey famously, but they defected here and we're working through that together. And um, my brother lives in Acton now, right near where um, Concord Academy is. And my mom is in Natick and that's where I am right now. And um, I wrote this poem um, at my brother's house. Um, so I guess it's a, it's a Massachusetts poem. <laughs> You'll see that clearly in the, in the text. <laughs> um, it's called Ride On Mower. There he is again, my neighbor on his ride on mower, out for a mow. Inside, I am attending to my inbox, which is furiously clean. Yesterday, it had 8,888 unread emails. It was full and delicious, like the idea of an apple. Today, under force of judgment, I have falsely emptied it through the sick magic of the search bar. I feel like I have performed a thorough bloodletting on a thoroughbred pet. I cannot own a fat red seed of unknown origin and move it coast to coast in my cheek like a Wonka treat for squirrel women and also unsubscribe from the mailing list for Nordstrom men's collection. I cannot be these two people twice. When I sat down to write today, I knew what I wanted to say. It was heavy and meaningful and written in Hebrew. I was gonna learn Hebrew. Instead, a little internet purge, a sudden want to be immediately alone and the wish that I could have it as fast as I want it, that I could already be naked in the shower, lifting my face up to the water's face, its breath pummeling my breath out of place a softness drilling its way through my dense center. Like when Hedgie said she was as a delicate whitefish in a sous vide, juicy and tender. And I said, 
I was a tuna steak in a neighboring sous vide. And she said, that's how you ruin a tuna. Outside my window, the neighbor is still running his ride on mower in neat circles over the grass. I know he's not out for a mow. He's out for a ride. I want to expand until I disappear. Be eaten in this steam like the sun bleeding out behind the last low clouds. This is the most complicated shower known to man. <laughs> it's also my fault, the being known to man part. What happened in the shower is that somewhere down the hall, someone turned on the faucet and the water on my face went instantly cold. And in that moment, I understood death calmly. And I was so full of that, that I looked up, but it didn't stop. So I looked down, but it didn't stop. The divine, the absurd, the bereft, the complete. Here was my shower shiva. Here was my Pantene Pro-V. Cool, we made it through that. It was a little bit of a marathon. Um, I'm just gonna check my time here. We're doing great. Okay, I'm gonna do two more and then I'll be on my way. So thank you so much for listening. Um, this one is called, um, What a Relief. I sometimes like to make a joke if I read this last. I'm like, this is probably how you feel, right? <laughs> Cause it's over. Um, <laughs> Ooh, how I feel. I'm schwitzing. And the only drink I have to sip from, unfortunately, is wine. I'm so sorry. Okay. What a relief. I have finally espied the rumored dog two chain link fences over. He is huger than promised. The rumor of him has closed around my life for two weeks now, like his giant rumored mouth. The certain dog that lives in my house is named Little Brother like a human, and takes tramadol twice daily by way of warm cheese. Even the disgusting chunks of life do not delight tonight. In the shower, my new loofah shakes the soap into thick dollops that land on my skin like cream. I am the messy and delicious underside of something new to the market. Why am I back in the shower again? I used to play this video game in which Spider-Man says over and over, hey, how did we get back to the city? I've been thinking about that sentence for 20 whole years. What if a shower was so important that it absolved someone of murder, like in that movie I wrote? Often I believe that I exist to remember everything and do nothing about it. <laughs> but then I smack a dutiful yoga mat across the ground and begin the meaningful work of giving myself less credit. Today, I was interviewed for the first time about my poetry, and one of the interns responsible said, I guess this next one's a little complicated. My question is, liquids? Do you know? I mean, could I tell you what I would give to look across the table at someone and say, you want to get out of here? And watch them nod, and watch them get up, and watch them go. Thank you so much. You have been attentive listeners, according to my comprehension of the four faces I can see. <laughs> and I've just had like such a great time and I can't wait to hear Chessie and Soren read. Um, and I'm gonna do one more for my book. Um, I'm gonna do one that I like hardly ever read. It's really a departure, but it's um, it's like, it's Hanukkah right now and so it, it it just feels nice to read a Hanukkah poem like he went on here with my family. So I'll just read it. Um, it's called Accidental Yurtzeit. And in case you don't know, Yurtzeit is um, like a person's, uh, wow, this tone is about to shift so abruptly. It's um, somebody's death death day when they die. And um, often on the anniversary of someone's death, um, you will light a Yurtzeit candle um, for 24 hours in like a remembrance. So that might be Helpful context, um, if you don't know. Okay. Accidental yard site. It is still early December. It is the beginning of the season of the death days of so many I loved and the birthdays of those other dead who died in different seasons. And the days are full of meaningful oak leaves, specific soups, a little sudden crying by the sheer blue curtains. You know when the sun catches a whole universe of hanging dust? 
a bit of light better lit by all the light that surrounds it. Under a white draped cloth, what you had made me, a menorah, black and steel, slim welds, opening fingers. And the candles were too large for their metal wells, so we whittled them thinner with paring knives. And you don't know that the holiday ended days ago, and I'm not gonna tell you. Nine white lights open their eyes to a night they've never seen. And the record player spins a slipping voice through the room. The heat is on, the couch is green. The dark days of my longing approach. They turn up my street, they fill my yard with omens. A sneaker tread, a gray fox and a red both together. A sapling seizing out of the ground like an arm. But inside your arm is around me. Outside there is loss, but inside there is a deep and abiding remainder. Tomorrow there is all that, but look, look at now, this, my sorrow suspended in your steel, my light lit up in your love. Um, that's such a, what a line to finish on. <laughs> it's like, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I've had just a, such, such a ball and uh, can't wait to hear the other poems. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was amazing. Uh, our next reader is, I got you else on the screen. Okay. <clears throat> our next reader is uh, Chessie Normo. Uh, she's the author of Great Exodus, Great Wall, Great Party, selected by Lee Young Lee for the 2020 APR Onikman First Book Prize. She received an MFA in poetry from the Michener Center for writers, I did do the double pronunciation, I'm sorry. At the Michener Center for Writers and was most recently the 2022-23 Ronald Wallace Poetry Fellow at the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing at UW-Madison. Current lives, lives in Madison, Wisconsin and edits a zine series called Girl Blood Info. Now please welcome Chessie. Hi, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I'm having a little internet problems. Um, but we're gonna see how it goes. And I apologize if it glitches. Um, I still had an amazing time listening to Sarah Reed. So that's hopeful. So, you know, anyway, I've had someone trying to help me who I love so much. <laughs> Thank you so much silently for trying to help me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, all is fine. Um, so like Sarah, my book uh, came out in 2020 and I'm also like, I'd love to read you new poems, um, but I'll read you one ceremonially, you know? Okay, so this is just a ceremonial, a ceremonial poem. Um, so, I'll read you the first poem in the book. Okay, um, I think it's nice especially too because it references, you know, reading The Wasteland in high school. And here we are. <laughs> okay. Um, ever. All the books on time are pretty good. When the boat carrying bubonic plague was approaching the Sicilian harbor of Messina, everyone on shore said, wait, look, something's wrong with that boat. It's moving too slowly, and only a few oars hit the water at a time. They watched it come toward them. When the boat arrived, they saw how everyone was either dead or dying. There's an essay I'm purposely not gonna cite because I think T.S. Eliot gets enough attention that says the books we read now change the books that were written before them. They actually change them. This is time in constant. There are different types of time, earth time, sacred time, another time concerned with human behavior. For instance, collecting figs, erecting columns, returning goats, tropical time, star time, atomic time, dream time supposedly, and a type of time that undoes itself. Let's me read the book that Amy wrote, which deals primarily with elephant grief, and then read The Wasteland to find it populated with the deaths of elephants who I had not realized in high school were there. Alternatively, if you don't believe me, try this. Read a letter I wrote you five years ago. Read it now. Read it after reading 
each subsequent letter I sent, in particular the ones where I admit I have loved you quietly from across the wall. Um, so that that's a little ceremonial. Uh, that's so, and now I think I'll just read you some new poems. And I just can't express enough how moved I am by being um, with you all. Uh, Kami was my incredible high school English poetry teacher. And I was thinking today about like, I remember vaguely the types of poems I was writing in that class. And yet she was so encouraging. <laughs> I was like the blood in the cartilage, there's beaks in the feathers. It was like a lot of like gory bird poems. <laughs> And she was like, okay, yes. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I'm feeling a lot. <laughs> and it's just so beautiful to be here with a teacher who was so supportive and inspiring. Um, and to be with uh, a poet who I looked up to so much in high school, Soren, who was a couple years ahead of me, and whose poems I thought were so cool. And, and now I'm also with Sarah, one of my very best friends, who's a poet I also look up to so much. And it's just a very moving event. And um, yeah, so... That's all I'm going to say about that, which was quite a lot, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a short poem for the winter. It's called Sorry, Alex. One winter, thinking ahead, I hid a snowball in my parents' freezer. And on July 21st, I threw it at Alex Ristelli. Unfortunately, the snowball had turned to ice in the freezer, and her cheeks split open in the yard. I watched the hot blood pour out, speechless, it wasn't what I'd expected to happen. This was one of those times I felt so smart for six months and then so stupid for the rest of my life. That's the whole poem. It's just a little winter poem. Um, okay, this poem, spring poem, uh, it's called Late Spring Carnival Thoughts. Um, never read it out loud before, but I feel strongly that maybe the first lines in I am pentameter because I added the words ho ho to it. So I don't know, never really figured meter out. Um, okay, late spring carnival thoughts. From my bike, I beheld goslings, ho ho. Then passed through a tunnel of trees filled with floating white fluff and thought, is this the fluff of goslings? It was like light snow drifting in and out of the shade. So miraculous, so much of it. I may have opened my mouth in awe and swallowed them. Later, I saw this fluff again, fallen now in snowbanks along the edges of the path and realized it came more likely from a plant, was even called pollen. I'm going to a carnival tonight, remember that? The mystery of an empty lot suddenly writhing with lights and metal, braces and pop. I will shoot the water pistol until the hangman drops. Wait, are you even attending a carnival if your sister's not with you? Both of you wishing the other was a boy with gelled hair, but then seeing what those boys were capable of, swinging stunned goldfish in puffed up bags of water, you felt grateful for each other. The fuzz in the air today, it's like a memory of powdered sugar, but nothing like powdered sugar really. All this painful beauty, Rainbow lights spinning the darkness, the path you bike along in your 30s in a green shirt you bought at Kohl's. I don't really know. This is seasonal. It's a stinging presence. It's so late May. I'm writing this all down outside while a sparrow struggles to swallow a long green worm. Both are overwhelmed by the experience. There's no point in telling you any of this. I know that. Of course, we both know that. And we both know who you are. Both understand that this call is coming from inside the house and that the house is inside a carnival, haunted and rocking on its foundation. Um, okay, so like, are you able to hear me when I read these tones or is it glitching like crazy? It's good, okay, great. I'm like reading very like clickily. I keep clicking back, <laughs> anyway. So cool, this is amazing. I can't believe it's working. This is like a little bit of a miracle. Um, so I'm calling you from Madison, Wisconsin. And um, this is a poem set here in Madison, Wisconsin, where I live, if you can believe it. Um, all right, it's called The Caribou. Originally, the zoo was built to remind us of our separation from nature. 
there was no animal in the cage, just earth. This reminds me of Tony's mom's suburban lawn in Madison, Wisconsin, overflowing with native prairie grass and signs from the sea that read, I am not insane. I keep the table in my closet quiet and empty, so it's like a cage of grass. That's where I write this poem now. It's Labor Day. Last night, the caribou was rammed with laughing people, none among us aware of what a caribou really is, how it lives, eats, feels, sleeps, talks, or dies. I drank rainbow cans of beer called Montucky Cold Snacks with the astronomer I share a blue house with. He uses a radio to map the Milky Way. That's the kind of speechless life a person craves, where there is no cage, just ink and distance, spots of light I won't ever understand, and beyond them, the soft hair around a black hole, remembering what it ate for lunch 20,000 years ago. Sometimes, me too. My soft hair catch the smell of what I cook or burn, and I walk around a record for a while. But I'm on a leash, guided over, even when alone, by a voice in presidential moon boots or the silk pants of a ringer, controlled by the fragrant ticket taker who sleeps in the booth in a chamber of my heart. Um, and now, um, perhaps an even newer poem, but also geographically speaking, I recently, with um, Tom, the one secretly behind the scenes trying to help me with the internet, um, he and I had a bit of a flight problem and had to drive all the way from Massachusetts, where perhaps some of you are, to Wisconsin in essentially a straight shot. <laughs> uh, anyway, it ended up being a beautiful trip. Um, this poem I wrote after that. It's called Towns. Driving here, we stopped at a gas station outside Buffalo, New York. Do you have a restroom? I asked the girl behind the counter. No, she said, and I feel your pain. I work an eight hour shift and have to wait until I get home. That's terrible, I tell her, like she doesn't already know. She asks if we're on the highway. I tell her yes. Then my recommendation for you is get back on the highway until you reach a different town. We keep driving, arrive in America's best value in, in two, at 2.30 a.m. The front desk is empty, save for a stack of local newspapers with the headline, sex offenders found not in compliance. In bed, we can't stop laughing in the dark about that being an in-house newspaper. Hotel news, available at check-in. How honest that would be. <laughs> I have a bad track record when it comes to choosing hotels, so I'm happy at the buglessness, the lack of mud on the walls, that in lifting the covers, we find no blood on the sheets. We'd been having a profound talk on the drive where I asked, five years into our marriage, what is your relationship to God? You said, spiritually, you were an ontologist which felt clarifying because politically you were a materialist. And somewhere along the way, you said the word hermeneutics, which made me laugh because it sounded like hermit, nudist, eunuch. But you told me it meant meaning messenger, a word for how meaning is transmitted through language. Oh, I said, recalling a few months ago in bed when I looked up from the book I was reading and asked you to explain post-structuralism to me my hair wet and soaking through the pillow, and you almost asleep answering me with your eyes closed. I felt like all the terms were clicking together now. Words were either the messengers of meaning or they were the meaning itself. I love the word itself, the thing, the world itself, eminence being my definition of poetry because to hell with transcendence, transcendence is for the words. The thing with driving is, you follow this unfolding black ribbon through the dark, lighting it with your chest as you move. And it can feel like each town materializes around you and disappears when you leave it. But that girl is still working in that gas station, which still has no bathroom. And those sex offenders are still not in compliance. And our conversation about God and being concluded in Ohio. Um, I think, you know, uh, I think I'm just gonna read you. Let's see, we got some, I'm, I'm doing it by hand. I'm tracking the time, which is interesting. 
uh, okay, this, um, this poem is called Seeming. Did people become more evil over time? Who here was alive when Judas kissed Jesus? Can you tell me how people seemed that day on the hill? Peter was in a panic. He drew his sword and chopped the ear off a soldier before Jesus said, stop. And Jesus hated that fig tree, but he loved kissing Mary on the mouth. I don't know. Was the world always like this? Cold and vast with singular moments of warmth? Nights rising over a lake, the steam coming up, the birds who live there slow and patient in their paddling and tongue extension, beating hearts like little fists of muscle driving the blood down to their feet. Have we always loved birds? What do we have in common? Um, I think, you know, I'm gonna just end it there. I, I'm so grateful that this um, worked. I can't believe it. So anyway, so I'm so excited to hear Soren's poems now. Thank you for having me be part of this. Thank you so much, Chesty. Those were also amazing. Um, our final reader of the evening is uh, Thorin Stockman. Um, his poems have appeared in Bennington Review, the Iowa Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, the Penn Poetry Series, among many others. And his poems have also been awarded uh, first place in the Narrative 30 Below contest, while his prose has appeared in the Fanzine, Kenyon Review Online, and Playboy. He's a recipient of fellowships from the Gloucester Writers Center, Wax Artist Residency, New York University, among others. Hailed by publishers weekly as perceptive and haunting, an acute and tender work of self-discovery and acceptance, Elephant is his debut collection of poems. Please welcome Sarn. Thank you so much, Matt, uh, for that wonderful intro. And thank you to Cammy and Matt for making this possible. Um, Thank you to Sarah and to Chessie for your incredible poems. I'm gonna echo what Chessie said. Um, Cammie is a, a dear poet and teacher in my life. And um, I feel like Cathedral of Wish may have been coming, may have been out when I was there. Is that right? Yeah. And I think I saw it and I saw, oh, four-way books. I wonder what that means. And now I got my, my book is called Elephant and it's also on four-way books. It came out in 2022. <clears throat> um, and I would read new poems, but I don't have them. So I am going to read the tried and true. Um, and I like to begin readings by calling back to poets past. This is one of my favorite poems. It's called Love Three by George Herbert. I'm a little intense, but he was very intense. Love Three. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, the ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame. My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. And this poem is called To Be Born. It's the opening poem in my book, and it was written after um, the last interview that Maurice Sendak gave to Terry Gross before he died. Beautiful interview. So um, check that out. I think the audio is still online somewhere. 
to be born. When I was young, I was really an old man. I remember it, delicate and spacious, aware I would become more honest, feel natural, knowing half of love is need. A serious young man, I had trouble saying yes to the bright, clear days with what pitiful ease we could change our lives out, something else in, but the tissue holds memory we don't quite know. One night, like a boxer dropping his gloves, I answered every question immediately. Slowly we laughed more. We were hysterical at night and morning blew the doors open. I ate a radish, never contracted chicken pox. My singing improved and women never stopped looking. Then my friends began to die. They passed through the beautiful old maples I watch from my window. What a blessing to love the world and then finally be born. So this book is sort of, it's built into a, um, a couple sections, but the spine, the thread of the book is the story of the elephant man. Um, it's a David Lynch film, wonderful film. Originally it was a play by Bernard Pomerantz. And it was a play based on the life of a real man named Joseph Merrick, who lived, who was born in Leicester, um, popularized into a, the sort of unhumanity that any kind of celebrity brings. Um, but I had a chance to perform the role on stage and it meant a lot to me. And I just started writing about him and to him. But the beginning of the book is really about romantic love, sensual physical love. Um, the middle of the book is about Joseph Merrick and the, the, the back of the book is about family. So um, here's one from the beginning of the book. It's called The Animal. And if wind rushes through leaves on each tree like a brush and night exhales the sound of water, I can hear myself breathe. And if I wake in the middle of the night, my head throbbing, and if I touch myself, not knowing what to do, and the pain leaves, if only until the morning, what have I done? Thinking of no one. If the voices I hear outside my window cease, I am kept awake by a deeper silence I cannot touch. Cobwebs mingle with what spiders have made and the trees keep dropping the seeds from which they came. If only in my imagination, if only at first, before I see the animal, the animal is real. So one of, we're going to move to the middle section now where Joseph Merrick lives. And um, a lot of the places I would put him in my life were, were moments or situations of tenderness or lack thereof. And um, one of them is a the time I was almost mugged while I was walking home in the Lower East Side years ago. There's some time of year, I think, when... Um, Sorry, my cat is very noisy. There's some time of year where a lot of the new initiation initiations happen and and these kids have to essentially like jump somebody to to be initiated into the gang. Um, and I was just walking home and there was a kid. He was like a kid following me. Anyways, 
I'll let the poem tell the rest. It's called Obad for My Almost Mugger. We are close enough. You cannot imagine I'm past your reach. I should have run. I haven't made it easier for you. I'm not sure, and then I am. Maybe you want to do it and can't, but I think you have to and don't. Your breath quickens, Joseph, and hardens your hands deep in your sweatshirt pocket. You come closer, and like a song I'm not thinking of, you fall away from me a bit and come closer again, balling your fists in that sweatshirt. Unable at last to pretend anything else is happening. Joseph, I think I am not alone in doing just that. Your eyes pummel a hole clean through the street we walk on, and you fill it with not hurting me, and then throw a match on that, and the not hurting goes up like dry leaves. We can smell it. You fill the hole again, and up it goes until we've reached the end of the block. Maybe you want to hurt me, and you are afraid. That wouldn't change your kindness. That's your fear, earned someplace you know well. Joseph, you don't mean that much to me. I mean, I don't think of you nearly as often as I would otherwise. We both know that. But I don't think anyone has worked so hard not to hurt me, worked so hard against their own wanting to hurt, as though you are saying, I'm very upset with you. I am going to kiss your cheek. And this is called, I should have mentioned, I just put his, I talked to Joseph in these poems. So if you hear a Joseph, it's Joseph Merrick. Fetish. I want to be alone. A snake rubbing its body on the ground, tasting I've loved you. I've loved you like I've loved highways the endlessness, watching highways go by, pulling over to the side of the road, imagining you in solitude. Our tenderness exposed me, a shade that cannot please itself or any other. I see myself as Lucifer lying in your bed, Heaven is the place I suffer. This is the room. These are the windows. I dig a hole in you. I jump. Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Shame on me. Joseph. Sovereign faith in what is vulnerable. Dignitary of the rocks, my heart breaks against softening. We're going to move into the, the back third now. So this are, these are family poems. Hi to my family if you're watching. Desire. I want to be a simple man the way my grandfather wanted to go to sleep when the sun went down. I want a small happiness to open over me like a cloud. And inside that cloud, all the electricity convulsing into a shriek of light that is my light. And this is called My Brother. This is one of my favorite poems because my brother used to carry it in his wallet. 
It begins with a quote from Lao Tzu. The quote says, true perfection seems imperfect, yet it is perfectly itself. That's the Stephen Mitchell translation. When he bursts through the door moments before dawn and turns on all the lights and puts on a record he loves. When he high fives the homeless man while sipping cider from our Tupperware container. When he can't stand the thought of me being angry at him. When he walks up 6th Avenue the wrong way through traffic when he couldn't wait for his baby brother to be born, when he tells me I am all that matters, when he autographs the night outside the bright theater, when the word us closes my eyes, scrawled thick on the lip of my bedroom shelf as he steadies himself, looking closely at his handiwork, when he wakes me to say, I must do better by myself, a moment he will not remember. When us knocks in my mind, the poem is already written. Uh, and this is called Nothing Moves. It's for a forest in Lithuania where a lot of bad things happened. And the forest is called Panerai. And I come home from work through Grand Central and there's this huge, excuse me, splashy advertisement for a watch. And there's a, it's a silver watch and there's a big shark behind it. And it says Panerai. And it makes me crazy every day because Panerai is the name of a forest in Lithuania where um, Nazis killed a lot of people. It's such a singular word from obviously it's in Lithuania, but Panerai, it's just very weird. So this is for Panerai, the forest. Nothing moves but this gold stroked grass. Wind in these trees whispering. White butterflies landing more and more carefully. The buried song, the song we are born from. Light brushing our bodies, cautious. We stand here, still here. Nothing but the earth moves, alive at least, thank God. And time steals through us. Nothing moves here, but what we can't see always thrashes. If we know how, if we can, we will bury this place in us, careful, whispering what? Like dandelions, we grow toward light we never touch, like everything that grows. All right, I got one more. Thank you so much to everyone who's with us. Thank you so much again to Cami and Matt and uh, and to Chessie and, and to Sarah. You really rock. You guys really rock. This is called Carousels. When your bare knees together chatter at night, Sleep, an animal prayer that never catches you. You, my dimly ever burning, my reconcile. Say your own name as I would, as I do. As late as it may seem, it is early. We are all our own children. Some people will care for you. You need to let them. They will leave you or you will leave them or not. I promise 
Your gentleness has already lasted so many lives. Remember the rain on the back porch? You were small enough then to catch all your blessings. I come from you as you come from me. Your journey is your own and I am here now as your mother. Listen, when the sky opens, your burden is your blessing. Release it and please care for yourself as you would your own beloved child. The beginning I love you from is everywhere. I'm Soren, this is Elephant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Soren. So amazing. Um, if anybody has any questions for our poets, uh, please feel free to send them in the Q&A or do the raise hand thing and I can unmute you. Or if you I wanted want to, to just say thank you. I wanted to say thank you so much. That was a spectacular reading. It was really terrific hearing all of you read and I was very moved by those poems. So deeply appreciated and uh, best wishes going forward. I wish you much, much writing with joy and ease. <laughs> And uh, really a pleasure uh, not to shut. If anybody does have a question, that's great. I just wanted to be sure to say that before we close out for tonight. Thank you, Cammy. I feel the same way. <laughs> I'm so grateful. That was so beautiful. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank you for going. thank you for lighting the path, Cammy. <laughs> Well, keep going and hope to see you again and read more of your work. Wish you right. I can't wait to read your poems too, Cammie. And Chessie and Sarah, what a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. I feel. Thank as you. Well. I'm verklempt, I'm overwhelmed. Great. <laughs> well, then I guess that's it for tonight. And once again, thanks to Matt so much. Thank you, Kim. Right. For, Bye for, for now, today. everybody. Thanks all. Look at the chat. You got some nice stuff scrolling in there. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Kim, for putting together this wonderful array. Thanks. My pleasure. Have a good okay. evening. Take care. Bye-bye, all.